Greetings and welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City and our weekend worship service. I'm so delighted to welcome all ye faithful to our service today. If you're new to our church community or visiting us for the first time, I want to extend to you a very special welcome. Even though our facilities are closed, our church is welcoming visitors and new members and your presence here, even your virtual presence, is a gift to us. Welcome. Ours is a busy church community and even more so during the holidays. We have a busy schedule of worship services coming up. In fact, they are so busy that you may even need to consult your calendar and your schedule. Next week, Sunday the 20th, our pre-recorded worship service will be our annual Lessons and Carols service. And, same day, our annual holiday pageant will be, next Sunday, live on Zoom at 10 o'clock. Now, I know that you want to catch both Lessons and Carols and the holiday pageant, and so you'll want to make sure that you watch Lessons and Carols at some time other than 10 o'clock. We want to see all of you at both services. You are not going to regret it. And of course, you'll want to be prepared to participate in the pageant, which is why our, relig our religious education professionals have prepared some props for you to pick up at the church. There are three bins at the front doors of the church, the north doors, and in this first bin here, we have halos, indispensable part of this pageant there. Here's some paper bags for you to put things in, candles. In the black binder here are animal masks for those of us who like to dress up for the pageant. And here's a bonus. We also have candles with drip catchers for Christmas Eve because it's just not a Christmas Eve candlelight service without drip catchers, right? So come by the church this week, pick up your supplies for holiday worship, and you can also drop off your food donations for our food drive benefiting the Utah Food Bank while you're here. Now you can find all the details, make your list, and check it twice by visiting our website or our Facebook page for more information. And now, we begin our worship service by lighting the chalice, the sacred flame of hope and freedom that represents our faith. Today we light it with these words by the Reverend Robin Tanner. Hark! The herald angels sing! We are called once more to a holy impatience and presence to live with an unquenched longing for the world as it can yet be, while also discovering the bits of that world already unfolding in our midst. We are in a time of readying for joy, even as injustice and suffering are woven into each day. This beautiful flower is an amaryllis. Traditionally, it's a potted flower that blooms near Christmas. I recently learned how you care for this plant. About six to eight weeks before you want it to bloom, you begin watering the bulb regularly in potting soil, making sure it has plenty of indirect sunlight. After the flower has bloomed and is starting to fade away, you cut the stalk way down until it's about an inch from the soil. You continue to water it throughout the spring and summer, and it'll grow a little bit greener and have little leaves, but it won't bloom another flower. For the bulb to bloom another flower, you have to do something counterintuitive. You have to let the bulb go dormant. You start with holding water, let the soil dry up. It has to go through this stage 
for the bulb to flower again. There's no shortcuts. Then the cycle starts again. About six to eight weeks before you want it to flower, you start watering it, caring for it. I asked my friend, a master gardener, about this once, and they said tending a flower like an amaryllis is always an act of faith. You have to trust that you've followed the process and that it will bloom again under the right conditions. When you start, you're never quite sure it's going to work out. But with faith and the power of the bulb and its beautiful cycle of growing, it will. This week, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, said this. Faith is what calls us to move forward in love and hope, even when we can't know how it will turn out. Even if we're not sure the flower will bloom, we still need to tend the bulb. Why? We have faith. has its own holiday rituals, some traditional, like decorating a Christmas tree, frying stacks of latkes, or baking cookies. Some families have non-traditional rituals. For my family, Christmas Day is a day for playing video games, just as it was most years when I was growing up. We like to eat foods that require no preparation, and we spend the whole day with the Mario Brothers, Link and Princess Zelda, and the rest. And many people also like to watch holiday movies on Christmas. And again, sometimes it's traditional fare, and sometimes not. You might think of turning on a film like It's a Wonderful Life, or Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, or maybe even The Grinch. But how about Die Hard? <laughs> it's one of the most vigorous debates of recent years, whether or not the 1988 Bruce Willis action flick is in fact a Christmas movie. Now, Willis himself says no, not a Christmas movie. But screenwriter Steven D'Souza says he wrote it as a Christmas movie. In fact, one researcher has written a paper using a whole range of data to determine the Christmassiness of Die Hard, breaking the movie down by number of references to Christmas, number of times the word Christmas appears in the movie, number of Christmas songs heard in the film, and other very important data points. This researcher determined, by the way, that Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. But the most important data point in the paper is that when Americans are asked what movies they think of as Christmas movies, Die Hard comes in number 22 on the list. This indicates that whether or not Die Hard was ever intended by its creators to be a Christmas movie, it certainly is one now. And the most important factor is simply that people like to watch it on Christmas. Now, I'm not really into action movies, so you probably wouldn't interrupt Die Hard if you called my house on Christmas Day. But every person, and perhaps every family, has just one or two things that just make the holiday. Or, to put it another way, the holidays just aren't the same without that special ritual. 
A study conducted last year showed that 52% of Americans try to recreate their childhood holiday rituals during this time of the year. That's a lot of nostalgia. And it's a lot of pressure, too. The holidays can be fun and delightful, but they can also be draining, exhausting us emotionally, physically, and financially, adding stress to what is already a busy time of year for many people. Grief wells up from years past as we see family members who have been out of touch or miss the ones who have left us, and old wounds may be reopened. Now, holiday rituals reduce anxiety by coding safety and continuity into our brain's hardware. These rituals communicate to us at a deep level that no matter what else is happening in our lives, some things never change. And those things are worth holding on to. This might be a year when we might be tempted to skimp on our holiday rituals. Things just won't be the same this year. We might say to ourselves, what's the point of dragging out all the trimmings or cooking a big meal just for myself or my small pod? But I want to encourage you today to go ahead and do those things, even if you have to adapt them somewhat to fit the circumstances. A year like the one now coming to an end is just the occasion for which all our ritual deposits over the years finally mature into a payoff. Far from losing their meaning, it is in a year like this one that the rituals take their deepest meaning. And that's something you can only discover if you leap out there and do them. In fact, I'd take it one step farther and declare that these holiday rituals are an act of faith. You may be uncomfortable with the word faith because we've been taught that having faith means believing in things that aren't real or can't be proven. We recognize a gap between science and the unknowable and assign faith to stand sentry duty in that gap, but count it as weakness. Surely our modern scientific rational minds can do better than this. Surely we are beyond faith now. But this is a very limiting definition of faith. Perhaps we could take our definition of faith from the theologian Paul Tillich, who broke it down better than anyone. Tillich argued that faith is a proposition that we make, acting as if it were true in order to test it. And therefore, doubt is a critical element without which faith cannot exist. We might propose, for example, that most people are really good at heart, and then test our faith in that proposition by living as if it were true, treating all people with kindness and expecting kindness in return. Now, something in us knows that this proposition might not be 100% true, our doubt protects us from the consequences of blind faith, which is not real faith at all. And yet, when we test our propositions, we find that we are able to live into a reality that is broader and richer than we imagined. Because doubt is indispensable to faith, Tillich says, engaging in acts of faith invokes risk when we are faced with risk, we must meet it with courage. Supposing we've placed our faith in others, and as in our example, we are bound to meet with disappointment as we encounter people who will not or cannot be kind. Yet, we do not lose our faith. We continue to gather more data through testing and act accordingly, and oftentimes find our faith restored. Risk requires courage, and it requires vulnerability as we put ourselves in the way of risk in order to test these propositions. And relevant to holiday rituals, Tillich argued that even dead faith could come alive through symbols and rituals because 
They invite participation. For Tillich, faith is a contact sport. Therefore, we must participate in rituals rather than merely observing them in order to be faithful. Once we know what a symbol means, Tillich argued, our faith has died. A living faith requires doubt, a condition of asking ourselves again and again if we are sure we know what the symbol means, and if not, what else it might mean. Do we know for sure what we are talking about when we talk about a baby born in a stable to an unwed mother all those centuries ago? Do we know what it means to follow a star towards a village in the middle of nowhere in hopes of glimpsing a child who would lead people to liberation? Let's propose that maybe the salvation of the world will not come to us through strength or wealth or power, but through weakness and vulnerability, through gentleness and softness, through love and through courage, always courage. And then let us test this proposition by being soft and gentle, vulnerable and loving and courageous during these holidays and see if we do not feel ourselves saved just a little. This year, when you come to the manger, come faithful, sit down, and let go of your ideas about what it all means. Come because you come every year just to see. Bring your doubts with you because you'll need them. Don't try to guess whom or what you might see in the manger. Don't worry about believing your eyes. That won't be asked of you. You only have to believe your heart again and again. Amen. I'd like to begin with a true story. It sounds as though it may be a bit apocryphal because, well, frankly, it is utterly bizarre. But it's well documented, showing, I guess, that even facts can come across as, well, seemingly unreal. So here we go. In 1841, Charles Dickens was visiting Scotland 
and took a walk one afternoon in the Cannon Gate Cemetery close to Edinburgh. Dickens, much like I and probably many of you, enjoyed reading tombstones. Those terse epithets inscribed on the stone of a grave would sometimes offer great insight into the life that was. And while on his walk, Dickens came across one tombstone which read, Ebenezer, middle name Lennox, Scroogey. Ebenezer Lennox Scroogey, 1792 to 1836. Inscribed were the words, a meal man, that's meal, M-E-A-L, referencing Mr. Scroogey as a corn merchant. But Dickens apparently suffered from a bit of dyslexia, or for whatever reason, took the tombstone to read, Ebenezer Lennox Scroogey, a mean man. So Dickens naturally thought, why would anybody place that indictment on a tombstone? Well, obviously, this was woven into a most memorable story, A Christmas Carol, featuring the heartless and miserly Ebenezer Scrooge, who certainly would warrant the epithet mean. In the story, Scrooge is visited by three spirits. The first spirit of Christmas past reveals the cold and lonely childhood Scrooge had suffered through, similar, I imagine, to the childhood Donald Trump probably had to endure as well. The spirit of Christmas present offers Scrooge a glimpse of Christmas joy that comes with the natural sharing of gifts with others. And even, even if you have very little to share, just the act of exchanging gifts and being in the celebratory mood, I mean, that's just wonderful in and of itself. And the spirit warns Scrooge that he had better open up to greater generosity. Bah, humbug. And then the spirit of Christmas yet to be literally brings Scrooge to his knees. He receives a, pre a preview of his neglected grave. Am I that man who lay upon the bed, he cried, and the finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit, no, oh. And he promises the spirit that if his name can only be removed from the headstone, he will honor Christmas in his heart every day of the year. Whew, what a great story about redemption. And once you recognize the future consequences of your present actions, the chances of transformation are, well, pretty good. What a great story about Christmas itself. It's all about how Christmas beckons us to be compassionate. Scrooge's indifference to the needs of others was magnified at Christmas. I mean, you can be mean if you really want to, not at Christmas time. If Christmas doesn't stretch your heart, <laughs> nothing will. The Christmas story, as told in the Gospel of Luke, not only gives us a history of Jesus' birth, but also tucked into that story somehow is a, a question about our own response to those who struggle. I mean, all we need to do is place ourselves in the role of the innkeeper to discover how receptive we really are to strangers seeking help. 
Well, of course, we have today a certain advantage in role-playing the scene at the inn. We know now how the story ends, while the innkeeper from 2,000 years ago didn't have a clue. So now we say, well, you know, if it were up to us, if I were the innkeeper, <laughs> well, Mary and Joseph would have had the, uh, the honeymoon suite and balloons and, and flowers for the baby, of, of, of course. But, you know, that, that would have messed up the story. We can, however, translate the circumstances in Bethlehem at that time to the deep inequities in our society today. We can then discover the degree to which compassion has any bearing at all on who we are and what we do. If a holy story were to be composed in 2020 and we were the characters in that story, hmm, how would that story unfold? Like the Spirit showed Scrooge the consequences of self-serving indifference, we today receive pretty powerful revelations as to our own inept ways of dealing with human suffering. The COVID pandemic has exposed society's apathy towards our neighbor, the poor, the stranger, to the very crumbling of any kind of moral obligation to helping those who struggle. You know, when you think about it, the year 2020 might well have passed all prerequisites to earn a rightful place as a contemporary biblical addendum. I mean, let's face it, some divine figure was pretty upset this year. Epic fires raged out of control in the West. Floods ravaged the Southeast. And the plague returned, unleashing death and hardship throughout the entire world. You know, the one truly divine revelation in this biblical addendum was that God loves New Zealand. I mean, don't, don't ask me why. Maybe, maybe it's all the sheep, and we know sheep are good followers. Or maybe it's because God is at heart a democratic socialist. It could be. I can hear the commandment, thou shalt wear masks. And then the devil whispers in the ears of countrymen, you need to ensure your autonomy and preserve your personal freedom. Masks be damned. But you know, it's, it's really all the same story, isn't it? It's about compassion and how the common good supersedes what is good for the individual. When the baby named Jesus grows up, his ministry is based actually on the golden rule. This is how he frames it in the Gospel of Matthew. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for that is law and the prophets. Jesus was talking about being faithful. That is, faithful to the law, that law resounding through all the ages throughout time, demanding that we be less selfish in order to let ourselves be touched by another's pain. Well, that, that is the meaning of compassion after all, to be less selfish in order to let ourselves be touched by another's pain. Now, when asked by a pagan to sum up the whole of Jewish teaching real fast while precariously standing on one leg, just to speed things up a little bit more, Rabbi Hillel, an older contemporary of Jesus, replied, 
that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That was it. I said, that is the Torah. Everything else is commentary. Islam demands fidelity to life's great principle. None of you believe, it says. In other words, you have no faith at all unless you wish for your brothers what you wish for yourself. Wow. That can clear the sinuses, can't it? You got to wish for your brothers what you wish for yourself. <laughs> His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, put it quite succinctly. My religion is kindness, he said. Well, that sums it up. Who needs seven principles? Who needs ten commandments if your religion is kindness? One more. 500 years before Jesus, Confucius, we must have concern for everybody all day and every day. We begin then to appreciate our profound interdependence and become more fully humane. It's the law and all the prophets speak of compassion. Now, because of where we find ourselves culturally in the world today, we celebrate Christmas, and we follow one of the prophets named Jesus, whose ministry aimed to remind us to awaken our hearts. And at Christmas, we would be nothing but hypocrites if we didn't pause long enough to acknowledge that there's a lot of room for us to grow more compassionate. Well, there's probably more room in Scrooge's life to grow in compassion, but just think about it. What a simply remarkable metaphor Scrooge has become for an exaggerated sense of self precluding all kindness to others, even at Christmas. Scrooge, however, offers an invitation to all of us to ask us how much, really, how much of our own ego has become our central focus in life. And as a result, like Scrooge himself, we are unable to let ourselves be touched by another's pain being crowded out by our own ego. Are we faithful to the law? Christmas nudges us along to to a deeper contemplation. What truly are our priorities in life? What do we value? What do we want and what do we think we need while denying others? To what are we willing to commit? Are we faithful to the law, expounded with urgency by all the prophets who ever walked upon this earth? Let us consider. So be it.
as we extinguish the chalice, may we be mindful of our, our great possibilities. May we rededicate ourselves this Christmas season to seek truth boldly, to show love constantly, to serve humanity faithfully, so that the blessings of peace be in our hearts and upon our world. O oh, come, O oh, come all ye faithful. Amen. <laughs>